they used the term environmental activist, I was like, what? But um, because I just felt like, you know, I just, all I wanted was to be able to drink the water that was coming and not get sick. Lead is um, a metal and it is very dangerous to humans. As you probably know, it's devastating to almost every organ system in the body and particularly nervous system, the nervous system and brain. brain. And that's why it's are particularly you, harmful you, to infants um, and children whose brains are still developing. Um, and scientists have kept looking for a smaller and smaller amount of lead below which they can say, well, if you're only exposed to this tiny amount, I it's listen. fine. And every time they try to find a smaller amount, they still I, yeah. find effects. And so the reality is there is no safe level of exposure to lead and there is no safe level of lead in blood. We thought it was just rashes. No, we started knocking on doors. We we're hearing people, teeth are falling out, hair, vision. We're like, whoa, this is bigger than what we thought. So we collected all of this data and what we would do from there we started having community meetings. So we not only canvassed the whole city, we decided we're gonna have a community meeting in every ward. And I would say like, that's one of like the long-term struggles now is, you know, especially in light of COVID. I know like I had very mild asthma before the water crisis and now my asthma is just is very severe but I would say like for me like I'm like you know I, I get afraid to leave the like I'm afraid to leave the house because I'm like if I get the coronavirus like I'm definitely gonna get a bit later like I probably should be on oxygen now because <laughs> I'm like I already have like very much diminished lung capacity Flint has been able to shine a light on on these issues all over the country. There have been so many positive ripple effects from what happened in Flint. Uh, people are now not naively just thinking their water is safe. Uh, more and more people are testing or and they're asking questions and they're trying to kind of um, validate before trusting, uh, be it their water or anything else. I think the PFAS issues that are happening nationally um, are really on the heels of kind of Flint's issues. Uh, so there is a lot of positive things that have happened as ripple effects from our crisis that give me so much hope. Um, you know, there's movements and there's activists and there's people who are inspired really by our story, um, inspired that they can also um, be part of a team, that they can also make a difference, that they can also defy the status quo. Um, and, and make the impossible possible. And this is Poison and Power, the Fight for Water, a Moral Courage Project, a partnership of the University of Dayton Human Rights Center and Proof Media for Social Justice. Welcome, everyone to the launch event of our Oscar Romero Human Rights Award Series. I'm Marina sister, Leanne Jablonski, and I'm very delighted to welcome all of you to see the fruition of the results of a great partnership, the Human Rights Center, UD Entities, and our Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission as a, we look at how we can live Oscar Romero's spirit in today's climate. For our event today, we invite you to utilize the chat box for your own comments, questions that may arise during the event. This is part of a four part series. We will skip next week, the Holy Week Passover season and resume again on the 14th and Wednesday the 7th, and the last event will be Tuesday, April 20th, all starting at 3.30 p.m. We do invite you to use this tiny URL.com forward slash Romero UD, today's date 3-24-21, where you will see the full bios of our speakers and be able to follow on the program and have some great links to the resources. 
We've been welcoming you in with the video, Poison and Power, the Fight for Water, a Moral Courage Project that the Human Rights Center has done with UD students and proof the media for social justice. It explores the access to clean water in multiple US locations, including Flint, Detroit, Michigan, and Appalachia. And you're invited to link to the podcast to learn and view more. We'll be featuring different parts of this video in each one of our series. We're going to replay it again now. Just invite you to enter in and let your heart and your spirit be touched by what is moving you to want to be a transformative agent for a more just and sustainable world. And listen, here's how I got involved in this. I had turned 24 in September. October 11th, we had the cold slurry spill. November the 2nd, I found out I was pregnant with my first child. Then I'll show you the warnings. I started getting these warnings on my water bill if you're pregnant or infant. Causes all these problems. So I'm not the type of person to sit back and just keep my mouth shut. So you either let them poison you and your child or you do something about it. So I've been very vocal. This base coal product had arsenic and mercury and very, very high levels of aluminum. And they made a movie out of it called Sludge. And the people in the town were experiencing rashes and their water, they didn't trust their water anymore. Um, they thought people were lying to them. They were probably right. And they didn't know what was going on with them. We've tested, I can't even remember all the areas we've tested. We, we went to see my great, my great grandson. Uh, and uh, as we was going, it was so funny. It's like, we got to pass by Golden Creek. That's an old area my family owned. It's called Golden's Mountain. And um, they strip mined it. So on the, we just took a little side trip there. <laughs> test the water you know what I mean it's untelling where we might start out going and we have no intention but we I keep the backpack and we have our stuff ready in the car to jump out and test the water and like I said I'm going to see my new great grandson it's like wow let's just stop for a minute and test this water <laughs> he's here he's healthy he'll be there and we get there <laughs> but like I said Lots of times we go, we, when we start out, we might not start out going to test water, but we might end up testing water. You know, I would not have considered myself an activist. The first time somebody called me in like the newspaper that they used the term environmental activist, I was like, what? But um, because I just felt like, you know, I just, all I wanted was to be able to drink the water that was coming and not get sick. Lead is um, a metal and it is very dangerous to humans. As you probably know, it's devastating to almost every organ system in the body and particularly nervous system, the nervous system and brain. brain. And that's why it's particularly harmful to infants um, and children whose brains are still developing. Um, and scientists have kept looking for a smaller and smaller amount of lead below which they can say, well, if you're only exposed to this tiny amount, it's fine. And every time they try to find a smaller amount, they still find effects. And so the reality is there is no safe level of exposure to lead and there is no safe level of lead in flood. We thought it was just rashes. No, we started knocking on doors. We we're hearing people's teeth are falling out, hair, vision. We're like, whoa, this is bigger than what we thought. So. We collected all of this data and what we would do from there, we started having community meetings. So we not only canvassed the whole city, we decided we're gonna have a community meeting in every ward. And I would say like, that's one of like the long-term struggles now is, 
you know, especially in light of COVID, I know like I had very mild asthma before the water crisis and now my asthma is just is very severe. But I would say like for me, like I'm like, you know, I, I get afraid to leave the like I'm afraid to leave the house because I'm like if I get the coronavirus like I'm definitely gonna get a ventilator. Like I probably should be on oxygen now, <laughs> cause I'm like I already have like very much diminished lung capacity now. Flint has been able to shine a light on on these issues all over the country. There have been so many positive ripple effects from what happened in Flint. Uh, people are now not naively just thinking their water is safe. Uh, more and more people are testing or, and they're asking questions and they're trying to kind of um, validate before trusting, uh, be it their water or anything else. I think the PFAS issues that are happening nationally um, are really on the heels of kind of Flint's issues. Uh, so there is a lot of positive things that have happened as ripple effects from our crisis that give me so much hope. Um, you know, there's movements and there's activists and there's people who are inspired really by our story, um, inspired that they can also um, be part of a team, that they can also make a difference, that they can also defy the status quo um, and, and make the impossible possible. And this is Poison and Power, the Fight for Water, a Moral Courage Project, a partnership of the University of Dayton Human Rights Center and Proof media for social justice. Thank you for being part of this series. Do know that you can access the program with that tiny URL link. As we begin the series and today's event, let us take a moment to reflect and pray. Source of all life, our hearts are broken as we recall the fear violence and injustice that killed so many in El Salvador, including their beloved Archbishop Oscar Romero, and the fears, violence, and racism that continue to sicken and harm our people and planet today. We desire to be your healing presence and ask for St. Oscar's courage in our quest for environmental justice and a peace-filled sustainable future. Thank you for the gift of this human rights series and all the organizing partners and participants. As we celebrate World Water Day this week, deepen our resolve to protect our climate and cleanse our life-giving waters that all people may thrive. Bless our presenters and open each of our hearts and minds that we may be renewed in our hope-filled actions now and until all hearts beat as one. Amen. On this anniversary of the assassination of Oscar Romero, we seek to explore a confluence of health and science, transformative communities in solidarity for environmental justice. And we welcome our own Dr. Vince Miller, who's the Grudorf Chair in Catholic Theology and Culture in the Department of Religious Studies. As he invites us into the listening to the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth, conversion, and environmental justice. As Vince speaks with us, feel free to write your own feedback, comments in the chat box. Thank you, Leanne. 
it's an honor to be part of these events honoring Archbishop Oscar Romero and Ora Lolita Chavez Ishkakik and the Council of Quiche Peoples. Uh, what I want, what I was asked to do today is, is talk about uh, Romero's witness from a theological perspective and, and connect that up with the concerns of this session, environmental justice. Uh, I wanna do that by first thinking about the ways in which we uh, revere a martyr like Romero uh, and the ways in which we tend to overlook the, the confusion they had in their own lives as they, as they sought to understand what to do. Their conversion and their actions are always bound up with discernment in uncertainty. So today is the 45th anniversary of Romero's assassination. Uh, which after much controversy in many decades, too many decades, the Catholic Church recognized as a martyrdom. How do we authentically learn from a martyr such as Oscar Romero? We can, re we can revere them. We can mine their writings for insights and truths to guide our own actions. We can try to conform ourselves to their moral wisdom. Uh, all this seems a good way to learn from and honor their witness. But there's a danger in this approach. We lift their insights, from the struggle of their lives, forgetting that their efforts to act in faith and justice took place in history where the way was not clear. We risk romanticizing their footsteps in a way that draws our gaze away from the ground beneath our own feet, longing for the martyr's standpoint, which has been rendered clear, obvious, transparent by hindsight and the saint maker's storytelling. To follow a martyr authentically, we have to attend to the shadows and opacity of their own struggle in history. From what we can learn, the risk, from that we can learn the risk of discipleship. Faith is seldom manifest in clarity and light, most often in the confusion and shadow of the cross. This can guide us to better walk in faith and justice and risk in our own ground, in our own time, responding to the needs and cries of our own people and planet. This tension is in the word martyr itself. Its root meaning is witness. Christianity gave this legal term a religious depth by applying it to those who gave the full measure of witness to the point of death. But it's important to remember that the meaning upon which the ex expanded understanding was built, witness. Martyrdom is then relational. It's not only standing in opposition to oppression of the faith, but also witnessing to the demands and hope of the gospel to a particular people in a particular situation and place. Christianity has venerated the martyrs since the late first century. In doing so, it brought the concrete stories of their lives into liturgical celebration. Uh, this brings a variety of consequences. The passions and acts of the martyrs are retold and remembered, becoming an ideal to be lived into. But at the same time, this tends to place them in an ideal liturgical time that lifts the concentrated drama of their final moments from the awkward and often halting prose of their unfolding lives. Human rights also has its own similar process of saint making and struggle to focus on the present as opposed to the victories of the past. A commentary by Sister Helen Prejean, uh, who was here several years ago, uh, herself a person always at risk of being made a saint, uh, speaks to both forms of idealism. She speaks about the first moments she spent in her current ministry. She said, after the execution, the first time, after the execution of Elmo Patrick Saunier, the first death row inmate she accompanied, she ran outside into the night and threw up. She said, at that time, there was no ministry, no clear understanding of what I was doing, no dead man walking, just me puking in the dark. So when we try to revere a martyr, when we try to understand a martyr, we have to attend to uh, their own context, not just the ideal, to their, to their struggles to know what to do in, in, the, in the darkness of history. Um, with Romero, that's hard in a way because his martyrdom lends itself to these kinds of illusions of clarity. His death itself reads like a overwrought, pious Hollywood script in some ways. After his last Sunday radio homily, where he had openly ordered in the name of God, for the soldiers of the National Guard basically to insurrection against their unjust commands, he turned to his legal advisor and said, you must leave now because they will certainly kill me. Romero's homily for the mass during which he was executed 41 
years ago today, references the grain of wheat that dies, but only in undoing itself does it produce the harvest. He was murdered, evoking in prayer the connection between the Eucharist he was celebrating and the community's shared witness. In his words, may this body immolated and this blood sacrificed for humans nourish us also, so that we may give our body and blood to suffering and to pain like Christ, not for self, but to teach justice and peace to our people. Shot through the heart, he fell next to the altar. These final moments of clarity, however, came only after years of struggle and ongoing conversion. In the short three years of his episcopate, his time as bishop, Romero changed from an unassuming, bookish, and somewhat reactionary safe choice for Archbishop. He was chosen by a papal nuncio who wanted a bishop who would be less political uh, to the Holy One who was murdered for his courageous defense of the poor. Scholars challenge the simplistic story that contrasts Romero before and after his work as bishop. Nevertheless, he did change profoundly. In his third week as bishop, his longtime friend, a rural pastor, a Jesuit Rutillo Grande, was assassinated along with an older parishioner, Manuel Solozano, and a teenager, Nelson Lemus, in their car. Grande and his companions were murdered by opponents to the parish's community, parish community's work for land reform. Romero immediately went to the town where they were killed and along with the villagers kept vigil in the church with their wounded bodies, with the wounded bodies of the slain, praying and talking with the prisoners through the night. As he would later say, when I looked at Rutilio lying there dead, I thought if they killed him for doing what he did, then I too have to walk the same path. Romero's practice as bishop crystallized that night and set him on a path of unfolding and ongoing conversion. In Pope Francis' words, referring to his own support for Grande's beatification, the stage on the way to being made a saint, uh, which requires a miracle, Francis said the great miracle of Rutilio Grande was Archbishop Romero. Romero committed himself tirelessly to the, what was called the preferential option for the poor, a term developed by the bishops of Latin America who had gathered in Medellin in 1968 to discern the meaning of the Second Vatican Council for their churches in their cultural and historical context. Romero undertook to be a bishop close to the poor. As he said, a bishop always has a lot to learn from his people. He traveled to distant parishes and communities often on foot through different difficult terrain. Much of the frustration of the rich who wished to be his patrons, he focused his ministry on the entire church, which in El Salvador, was overwhelmingly poor. Now talk of the poor can be problematic, especially in Christianity. Concern for the poor is central to both the Jewish and Christian Bibles, uh, but sometimes to speak of the poor risks obscuring the history and injustices which produce their poverty. The poor aren't so much a particular group of people, but the members of humankind who experience its failures, injustices, and sins most profoundly. Romero repeatedly repudiated shallow charity for the demands of justice. His conversion was ongoing. The same call to conversion continues today. In the years since his death, we have come to much greater awareness that the structures he condemned um, against which he worked are not simply the product of the moment, but they're the legacy of Western colonialism. European colonialism in which the church was and remains profoundly complicit, exterminated, subordinated, and enslaved indigenous peoples. Viewing the rest of the world as what Locke termed terras nullius, empty land, not being worked by its inhabitants, colonizers set up a system of plunder that treated the geological and biological goods of the earth as resources that could be extracted without concern for local communities or ecologies. The church's mission has been profoundly disfigured by the racist and genocidal and ecocidal aspects of colonialism. This is not an issue of merely historical significance. What Daniel Castillo terms the 500 year project of colonialism lives on in the contemporary world. Although we disavow colonial violence uh, in the church and all human relationships, are still profoundly structured by its divisions and exploitations. 
the real relationships between church members in the global north and the south are to this day more likely to be structured by these colonial logics than by the communion of Christianity. Globalization enmeshes, enmeshes us all in the structures which Romero sought to challenge. In Catholic terms, the members of the body of Christ of the church are too often bound together not by the logic of the gospel, but by the sinews of colonial exploitation and global capitalism. Attending to the legacies of colonialism helps us see the environmental aspects of this violence against which contemporary groups such as the Council of Quiche peoples struggle, mines, dams, massive monoculture, monocultural plantations, all built for export to our markets. Indigenous peoples are expelled from their land, ecological communities are destroyed, all to feed the global market and to feed us. Today, the option of the poor, for the poor must include not only political solidarity, but also attention to the de destruction of ecosystems and environmental justice. The poor are the least involved in this destruction, but as we see around the planet, from our country to Central America, they often suffer the most for it. We are caught in and perpetuate endless webs of injustice and ecological destruction. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis called for an ecological conversion in which our hearts are moved to action by the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. We have much to be converted from, much to repent of, as Romero would say. By attending to his life and his struggles to respond to his moment, we can perhaps find a way to better imagine with courage and trust and risk our response to our own moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vince. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Tony Talbot. I am the Director of Advocacy here at the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. And I really want to thank uh, Sister Leanne and Dr. Miller for their remarks and reflections uh, opening up this series. <clears throat> and what I'd like to do right now is essentially uh, do a little bit of interaction and a little bit of reflection ourselves to get a brief snapshot of uh, what all of us are thinking at this moment. Um, I'm going to use an, an app called Minty. I'll screen share here in a moment. And um, Minty will we'll use this app to produce a word cloud for uh, what we're thinking as to the, the question of really what do we need to do to uh, accomplish uh, environmental justice. Uh, environmental justice is the theme, the overall theme of the uh, series uh, that we're doing. So if you could please use the um, link that I put in the chat, or if you have a device or a phone, just scan this QR code um, that should be up on the screen now. Or you can just type in minty.com and use this code uh, that's listed here. Um, you'll to write in some brief single words or very short phrases in response to the question. If you have problems with the app, feel free to write your answers to the question in the uh, chat. So environmental justice is defined as the fair distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. What do you think are the major barriers to realizing this? And as you can see, the way the cloud is developing right now, right at the core of it, we see racism, greed, capitalism, poverty, resource extraction, government structures and exploitation, profit. Um, it's interesting and we will uh, save these um, clouds and we have another reflection a few minutes uh, down the road that I think where we can maybe contrast some of these answers with the answers we have toward the end of the program. Thank you everyone. And as we continue to go, feel free to share your thoughts and reflections in the chat uh, throughout the rest of the afternoon. Sister Leanne. We have a tremendous honor today 
of having with us Dr. Adrian Hollis, who is the Senior Climate Science, Climate Justice and Health Scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And Adrian has been doing her work for several decades, comes to us with degrees in law, degrees in public health, and tremendous on the ground work. Adrian, we thank you so much for sharing your experience from your own life and from the DC Beltway. And we look forward to you um, inviting us to reflect on St. Romero, environmental justice and confronting climate impacts. Thank you so much, Leanne. And thank you to the University of Dayton Human Rights Center. And, um, you know, uh, when I was asked to do this, I thought it was, I didn't know much about um, St. Romero, but I've learned a lot. And I think that the title of today's session, Living Oscar Romero Spirit in Today's Climate is perfect for um, the work that I, that I do. And what I'm going to do is take you on a tour, take you sort of on a, a learning tour of um, uh, environmental justice and what that looks like in the work that I do. And uh, some of the quotes that really spoke to me and the work that I've been involved in for more than 20 years. So right now I'm going to share my screen with you. So what I kind of wanted to, what I want to talk about is the fact that, you know, I'm very pleased to be here because my first interaction with the church, the Catholic church, I am Catholic, and um, environmental justice was uh, when I was in Tallahassee, Florida, and there, in the bulletin, uh, it announced that there was going to be a um, meeting later that evening to talk about environmental justice. And I got really excited because that was the work that I do. And when I got there, it was talking about everything but people. And so I was uh, very disappointed in uh, that. And I did get up and say that this isn't the environmental justice that I know. And um, you know, we started talking about what environmental justice encompassed, not only the uh, ecology, but also people, so people and the planet. And it stems from this, and, and um, actually I, I, this quote is, is so um, apt. Uh, we're talking about um, um, some people having everything and others having nothing. And that's sort of like what environmental justice talks about, the fact that you do have the haves and the have not, and that's not fair. And so when we talk about environmental racism, it's nothing new, right? We already know that race is the most significant predictor of a person living near a contaminated site, and that most of the population that lives near a toxic waste site is a person of color. And most of them are exposed to emissions because they live near highways or in areas where there's a lot of traffic. And when it comes to water, they're two times as more likely to live without water and sanitation. And actually, I went to a community a few years ago in Louisiana, and the community did not have running water. And when they were when the um, question was was put to the authorities, they said we didn't know they wanted it. So um, it, it's it's just mind boggling the the things that people actually uh, believe or can say. So when I talk about environmental justice, I, I envision it like this umbrella, and it it, it is um, sort of like the structure under which other types of justice falls, climate justice, immigration justice, um, criminal justice, and things like that. So it encompasses everything around us and, and everything we interact with, and it's both external to us and internal to us. You know, we have our internal environment, the things that we ingest and drink and, and just the way we feel. And sometimes we know we don't feel just right. And then it's everything that affects us, whether we live in a safe environment, whether it's like today here it's raining and it's a little chilly and things like that. Okay. So what, so when we talk about EJ, it has so many different meanings, environmental justice. And people always ask me what is it and, and, and what it is, it, is uh, more importantly, what it is not is equal pollution. And what it is, is equal protection. And so it's saying that everyone has the right to live in a clean and safe environment and to have access to clean water, right? And to, and to ingest food that is not contaminated and that is healthy and not full of um, um, toxic products. 
And uh, um, I should, when I talk about food, I'm talking about what we call food insecure areas, or uh, some people know them as food deserts, where a lot of communities don't have access to grocery stores because of the uh, area in which they live. And in some instances, what they have is a food mirage, meaning there are stores in the neighborhood, like a, a Whole Foods, for, exist, for example, stores that exist, but that people can't afford to shop in, right? And so they still um, will go to the dollar store and the corner store and eat unhealthy foods, which of course can impact their health. And you see increased diabetes and uh, in increased obesity and things of that nature. So um, what I'm showing you, and I, I must have missed that slide here. What I'm showing you is that um, the information that I'm comparing, I guess, or contrasting or making an analogy to is uh, there are two different documents that we follow in the environmental justice movement. And one of them is called the seven, it's called the principles of environmental justice. And there's 17 of them. And this, these were actually developed in 1991 at a meeting here in, um, in Washington, DC. There were over a thousand participants, both from the US and other countries that really got together and hammered out the best way to respect each other and respect the, the land that we're on and the condition that we live in. And um, it, it sort of formed the premise, the basis for the uh, Environmental Justice Executive Order 12898 that was signed by President uh, Clinton, then President Clinton. And it also led to the existence of the Interagency Working Group on Environmental Justice, which has um, under the new administration, um, I guess, has had new life breathed into it. And the second document is the Jemez Principles for Dem Democratic Organizing that was created at a meeting in Jemez, New Mexico by a number of environmental justice um, advocates um, and organization leaders. And it pretty much says, the other one had 17, so I didn't want to put them on here, but this is six, there's six principles, right? To be inclusive, and to emphasize, the emphasis should be on bottom up organizing from the people, right? So it shouldn't be just top heavy um, agencies making decisions. It should include people. And in that regard, we should let people speak for themselves. And when I do say something, I'm saying what was told to me, what I learned from working with others. So I don't pretend uh, to speak for other people. And then we work together in solidarity and, and mutuality. And this is across the board. We talk about people of color, um, the Latinx people, the indigenous people, everybody, um, poor people, rich people working together to address um, environmental concerns. And, that, and as part of that, we build relationships with each other that are uh, based in justice and equity and respect. And then we make a commitment to be to our own transformation. So um, this particular um, quote, the ones who have a voice must speak for those who are voiceless. It's sort of like the foundation for my work because I always say, even before I knew that, you know, this was from a Saint Romero that I, whenever I can, I take the opportunity to speak for those who have traditionally been ignored been left without a voice or have had their voices ignored. And then what I also do is ensure that they have a place at the table so that their voices are heard because no one can really, I can't tell you about the experiences that someone else has. And it's more impactful and powerful to hear it from them. So, um, and I'm not going to read these, right? So um, St. Romero talks to us about peace and justice and the necessary for it, the, the necessity for peace and the necessity for justice. And it's, it reminds you of the work of Martin Luther King Jr., right? Where he talked about peace and, and peaceful protests and, and, and justice and how uh, things were going to work out. And in the same vein, recognize that, you know, um, in the name of what's right and fair, that his life may be forfeit. Not, not in an, um, you know, unfairly so. And so, um, as I mentioned before, the Hamas principles speak about having these relationships. So um, one, I wanted to point out to you before we get into the, the data, 
about um, something else that um, St. Romero said, which is that we suffer with those who have disappeared, who've been had to flee their homes and those who've been tortured. And I immediately think about the indigenous um, and um, murdered and missing women. Um, over 500 women were missing just last year. And it usually occurs when man, caps, man camps are created when a pipeline is um, about to be built in a community. And the issue is that no one really looks into that. And then around climate change, we see people who are displaced or are forced to migrate uh, both in this country and outside of this country. And, and people who, who are homeless for one reason or another, whether it's by choice or by situation, or people who've lost their homes as what we saw with uh, um, um, Hurricane, um, uh, Hurricane Laura and all the hurricanes as they hit um, Louisiana and Texas and other places. So when I mentioned earlier about the fact that no one can tell it what happened and describe a situation like the communities who live it, this struck me. There are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. And I think the, the video that we saw earlier just illuminated this um, particular quote is that when we talk about environmental justice and you hear how people's lives are impacted, you know, it, there's nothing else as, more, as important as that. You know, I, I always start my, my talks with first the land recognition, which I didn't do today. And the fact that I'm sitting on the Nakash tank, a stolen land that is also known as the um, Anacostia tank, um, excuse me, the Anacostia. And so, uh, but second, I tell my story that I grew up poor and I grew up in the shadow of the power plants. And I had people in my family that couldn't breathe because of the uh, contaminated air. And, and that's impactful because you know that I speak from a position of knowing, right? So let's jump quickly to what we see with climate change. We talked about the fact that, what well, we didn't, but we talk about climate change and environmental justice. What I neglected to mention, and I should have, but I'm so excited to talk about this, was the fact that everything that communities ex um, experience is based on systemic racism, the way people have been treated. And that started, or you know, we're gonna put skip fast forward past slavery and talk about redlining when communities were literally outlined as areas where uh, that were considered not a great area to live in based on the, the, the number of black people who lived in that area, the number of people of color. And the, that was also what prevented people from developing generational wealth, right? And then with redlining came things like um, um, Lulu's, which are locally undesirable land uses and NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, where people who were wealthy and whose voices were heard were often um, allowed to protest having um, landfills and incinerators in their communities. Well, they had to go somewhere, right? And they ended up in communities of color, and which is an environmental justice issue, which is why I said not equal pollution, but equal protection under the law. So you have these communities that are already impacted by environmental injustice. And these are the same communities that we see when we look at issues around climate change, right? And so quickly, just some of the effects that we've seen that I'm gonna focus on, of course, is rising temperature because we've done a, a recent report of, at that for, on that at the Union of Concerned Scientists where I work. But we also see a lot of extreme weather. We saw what happened in Texas a couple of weeks ago. We see rising sea level and we see increases in the CO2 levels, which leads to global warming. So when we talk about heat related illness and death, um, for cities, they, we say the heat is on and the people who are most at risk include the homeless or those who have little or no access to green space, to parks and trees. And that's mostly um, black communities and communities of color, which are also considered to be urban heat islands because the, the concrete that they're surrounded with absorbs the heat and releases it throughout the, e the day and the evening and there's nowhere to go. And so there is no escape. And think about that in terms of COVID-19 when you're supposed to shelter in, spit in your place, but there's no, it's hot and you have nowhere to go. So where do you go? You go outside. And so that whole distancing is a sort of, um, is not something that, not the first thing that people are going to be concerned with, okay? So some of the health effects quickly are, it affects the head, the mouth, the heart, you see, 
heart attacks. You see is issues with lungs, with breathing. Long before George Floyd, Mr. George Floyd or Eric Gardner talked, you know, screamed that they couldn't breathe when they were being murdered or 70 other people did the same. Communities were saying it because of air pollution, that they couldn't breathe because of the situations under which they were placed because of systemic racism. And here's a map just showing you the African-American population by county, and that's in the bottom right. And this is just, um, the purple shows the, the greater, the greater um, percentage of African-Americans. And this is important because I'm gonna show you on the next map, when we talk about heat, um, the average days per year that we'll see of increased heat with climate change. And this is historical up until um, 2018. And in the future, up until 2030, you see that the area has expanded where we'll see more than um, three months of uh, temperatures above, no, more than one month of temperatures above 100 degrees. And these are the same areas where African-Americans live and the counties, and this, that's just what this is showing, the counties where African-Americans live and also the counties with temperatures above 105. We see the same, a similar pattern with our uh, Latinx population that the areas where the temperatures are going to increase are the areas where because of systemic racism, they were forced to live. Now, I wanna add to that COVID-19 because what we know is that the Native American population, the black population, the Latinx populations all had the higher numbers of uh, COVID-19 and death. That is because of the pre-existing conditions that I mentioned earlier because of the exposure to environmental contamination and also um, the effects of climate change. The environmental contamination makes the lungs more susceptible to infection. COVID and uh, COVID-19, of course, uh, takes advantage of that. One of the pollutants that people are exposed to is um, particulate matter. And the theory, the research shows that COVID-19 particles sort of hitch a ride on those particulate matters, which then allows it to get deep in the lung. And that is one of the reasons why people are more susceptible, people of color are more susceptible. And that is called a syndemic. When you have two or more health issues, that affect the same population. So here we have structural racism, environmental injustice by the contamination that I told you about, climate change and COVID-19. And so when we start addressing structural racism, we start breaking that chain. We start addressing environmental issues and climate change and COVID-19. And that is where my hope lies with this administration. And so I wanted to end with this wonderful uh, quote um, by uh, St. Romero that we are the prophets of the future, not our own, because what we're fighting for with climate change and with COVID is the future for our children and our children's children and those who come after. And so that we as individuals have to recognize the importance of the resources that exist. And we have to produce as little waste as possible and make sure that our carbon footprint is not so large that we're affecting those who come after us. We also have to educate people so that they recognize what, you know, their role in all of this. And, and people always say, well, I'm just one person. You know what? One person can make a difference. And just imagine how many people, you know, said that I'm just one person, right? Martin Luther King didn't say it. Um, um, St. Romero didn't say it. One person can make a difference. And that's something that I want um, for us to take away um, from the talk if we don't take anything uh, else away. And at this time, I, if we're having question and answer, I'd be happy to answer your questions. If not, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. There have been uh, some questions in the chat box and people feel free to add others. We do have several minutes that we can take right now. So one of the participants thanked you and said, this is incredibly challenging work. You have a lot of experiences. What are some of the successes you have seen working with communities on EJ issues? Oh, what a, a great question. You know, what I've seen is, you know, communities have adopted the, the, the thought that um, the Calvary isn't coming. And this was pretty much in the last administration. 
And so what I've seen is communities sort of take the lead on things that they need to be resilient. And I'm quickly, for example, a community in South Carolina has teamed up with an, um, a, a business that um, manufactures hydro panels, which are solar panels that collect water out of the, out of the environment, like um, on humid days or uh, evaporation, whatever, and collect water so that they will always have access to drinking water so that they won't, there won't be more Flint's and other places, New Jersey and more places like that. So when I see communities recognize their power and act on it, that makes me happy. Another question that came in was, again, affirmation, thanking you for a great way to weave this Thank all you. together. What key recommendations do you or Union of Concerned Scientists have to begin the needed transformations towards true environmental justice? Another great question. And actually, um, you know, you, the Union of Concerned Scientists and, and other organizations are are going through um, a period where you know they are making sure or ensuring that they are anti-racist, and you know that is a big lift for all organizations, and that's something that I'd like to see across the board. And that is the first step: is to recognize your own um, unconscious and conscious biases, because that will make it difficult to interact with others, right? If you have um, certain misperceptions. Um, another thing is to really understand the need to partner with others, with stakeholders, other community, I mean, with the community, with environmental justice community, and listen and recognize that they are equal stakeholders. They're not people that you do things to or you come in and do research on, but that you engage and plan activities with to address, to answer questions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. What What is your hope for University of Dayton and what we might be doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, <laughs> I hope that University of Dayton continues the work um, in the Human Rights Center. You know, the work is so impactful and we need more of that. And I hope that the work that the University of Dayton is, is doing is something that becomes a model for other universities and not just universities, but for other entities, other organizations. That's great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're getting these comments on, you know, the multiple <laughs> pillars of what we've got to do with new technology, social, economic, political transformation too. And I know, Pope Francis has a lot of hope in saying, you know, the percentage of people in the world who are from the Catholic tradition and all joining with all other people who from our faith tradition say it's more, it's a moral imperative that we respond on these issues um, to really hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And if we can, and if we can really work together that can really catalyze the change. So thank you for being part of, of that. Thank you. And I just want to say, you know, with this administration, I think that they really hold what the Pope says um, close because you see that they created this task force of faith community. And that's impactful and something that's, I don't think that's ever happened before. And um, we see the faith community doing a lot in the space because the church is one of the most trusted places to go to get information, right? And, you know, and it's the cornerstone of people's lives. So the church plays a very important role when it comes to education and outreach and partnership and protecting communities, actually. Um, my colleague's church, the one I was talking about, um, he's trying to get it approved as a shelter uh, and also as a cooling center and things of that nature since the city has not done so. So I think that the words of the of uh, our pope have really been taken to heart by this administration and, and i'm just so excited to see what happens especially when it comes to environmental justice and how we're involving all of the partners well thank you very much uh, for you. being with us and we hope that the, that the relationship will continue with union of yes. concerned scientists and your own work as we explore what we can do together thank you
we now welcome Leslie King, who's the director of the Leadership Formation and Rivers Institute at the Fitz Center for Leadership in Community. And Leslie will introduce us to a number of the experiences that the students at UD have engaged in. Thanks, Leanne. I just want to thank Adrian once more too. Um, Adrian, that was very inspiring and um, left me feeling very hopeful with the work that you're involved in right now and that what's going on currently. Um, my hope also is that you all feel pretty inspired after hearing a little bit about what the UD students are involved in um, currently, which hopefully then are our future leaders who will be doing this work in the future. Um, at the University of Dayton, students engage in a variety of, of ways through these human rights, social, environmental, climate justice issues. Um, they have hands-on experiences, whether it's through their academic departments and their honors theses, whether it's through the many institutes and centers at UD and initiatives, um, including the Ethos Center in the School of Engineering, the Human Rights Center and its initiatives, including the Moral Courage Project, which we've learned about today, Hanley Sustainability Institute, its many initiatives on and off campus, or the FIT Center for Leadership and Community and its many programs, including the River Stewards. Um, we take our work seriously in how we engage students in these communities, how we work um, with them to get them to really gain the skills of collaboration, the true art of collaboration and what that truly means to work with communities to build a healthy watershed, to build a healthy community um, and to really transform together to co-create new solutions and frameworks that do address these issues. Um, whether it's through the arts, whether it's through education, engineering or activism, um, these students really put themselves out there and they show up, they show up every day at the table and they do exactly what Adrian says. They help be a voice for those who have no voice or even better, create a seat at the table for them too. Um, I'm one of many on campus that has the honor and privilege of working with them. And um, we're excited to show you a short video of these students. First, I'm gonna introduce Claire Sullivan, one of the students that happens to be involved in almost all the initiatives I just mentioned um, through her many engagements at UD and in the community. Um, and she's a biology major, a political Political science minor and sustainability minor. Um, she's also a national NUMIC Civic Fellow with the Comp Campus Compact. Um, she works with the Hanley Sustainability Institute, has been a leader with the Moral Courage Project and in the River Stewards Program. So um, she's going to briefly talk about her experiences and introduce the video that I hope you all enjoy and take a minute to um, um, feel inspired. Thanks, Claire. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for attending today. So like Leslie said, I'm a senior here majoring in biology with minors in political science and sustainability at UD. I've been a part of the River Stewards program since my freshman year and have loved doing work with the Little Miami Watershed Network and other community partners. I'm also the education team student leader at the Hanley Sustainability Institute where I coordinate a team of volunteers to implement sustainability dialogues and presentations on campus to students. And we're kind of moving past students and that's exciting also. Um, I'm on this year's Moral Courage Project team and I'm so excited to be a part of sharing the stories of many amazing water warriors around the world with you. Uh, the following video shows some insights from my fellow students who are campus leaders in sustainability initiatives from HSI's education programs to the Ethos Center and to the work the River Stewards, are, River Stewards are doing with Basha Erland, you'll see how UD students are experts at looking at issues from an interdisciplinary lens. The work that students, including myself, do through our centers and institutes are instrumental in our college experiences. You may find that many of us are interested in pursuing work in environmental and social justice focused areas and this Interest is in large part due to the experiences that we've had in these programs. I myself am interested in environmental law and policy, and I can attribute that to my experience in programs like the core program, my membership with River Stewards and HSI, and just the experiences that I've had here at UD. 
So this video is about 12 minutes long. Uh, so feel free to turn your camera off, relax, and engage through the chat box throughout. So I'll turn it over to Carlos and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shannon Stanforth and I'm a senior graphic design major and sustainability and biology minor. I'm involved in a number of sustainability organizations on campus, including Sustainability Club, uh, River Stewards, and the Hanley Sustainability Institute. The Hanley Sustainability Institute seeks to engage with students across campus and within the community into further sustainability initiatives on campus. And some of the ways they do this are through education programs. I'm a member of the Sustainability Activation Program um, where we present to students across campus and engage in discussions about sustainability. They also have an energy team, a food team, and a water team. So they are focused on a number of issues and working to make the campus and community as a whole a more sustainable place. Sustainability education is another one of their main focuses and I've had the opportunity to kind of combine my studies with graphic design and sustainability into an honors thesis. And this thesis explores the linkages between the fields of sustainability and design through the creation of a children's book. So I was able to have the opportunity to conduct research over the summer and over the past two years, where I read a lot of books about sustainability and about um, children's books, about methods of education, and kind of decided on the narrative that I wanted to tell. And I was um, also looking to have the book be as sustainable as possible as it communicated a sustainable message. So I created the book out of recycled magazines and colored pencil illustrations. And then I also selected 100% post-consumer recycled paper from the Nina Environment Collection. And I selected a font which was considered a sustainable typeface because it uses less ink when it's printed on the page. So these are just some of the ways that I sought to make the book more sustainable and combine what I've been learning about sustainability and design in my courses. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight some of this work and to highlight some of the organizations that are hoping to help make the campus and community a more sustainable place. Hi, my name is Victoria Jacobs and I am a sophomore at the University of Dayton. I am an environmental biology and adolescent to middle education double major. While on campus, I'm on the club swim team, I'm in sorority life, and I'm in River Stewards. So River Stewards is a group of individuals who are all motivated to do the same thing. We're motivated to learn more about our community and how we can help others and how we can help our rivers and our waterways. We're interested in learning about civic engagement and environmental literacy skills and educating ourselves and others about what Dayton has to offer and what the environment has to offer as well. We do a bunch of service projects throughout the year and um, at the end of our three years, we'll do a final senior capstone project. We also have, have fun and you know get to experience the rivers and go kayaking. But um, as of right now with the pandemic, we're doing a lot of service um, education online. Um, so all of us have been doing our own service projects that have focused on learning about our community and our needs and finding community partners for later projects. And one of our community partners that I wanted to talk to you about today um, is Basia Ireland. Um, and we're super grateful to have been asked um, to help her with her ice book project. Uh, she's a renowned eco artist and one of our dearest river friends. She works with many communities around the world to develop eco art projects to represent the injustices rivers and waterways and the people have faced. Her work spans across disciplines such as ecology, biology, social and environmental justice, and visual arts. This year she asked the river stewards to help participate in her second iceberg project which my friend Grace and fellow River Steward is going to describe for you now. Hello, 
my name is Grace. I am so grateful to be able to speak with you all today, even if it is over a video format. Um, I am a sophomore biology major with a double minor in chemistry and sustainability. And I am also in the 23 River Stewards cohort with my friend Victoria, who you just heard from. Um, I would like to continue to speak with you all about our awesome partnership with renowned eco-artist Bajia Ireland. Now, her work is vast and is very expansive, so I highly encourage you to check out her website because I cannot do her justice in this short format that we have here, but I will give somewhat of an overview. Um, she organizes gatherings, gets people to engage with their, their riparian zone. A lot of times alongside those gatherings, she has sculptural backpacks that have everything in it that you need if you are to um, explore this river. So it has vessels to hold some of the river. It has um, guidebooks, photographs. Um, it's, and then uh, finally, there are the ice books, which is what we are lucky enough to be a part of. Um, I can describe the ice book that I made. So it has it's, it, just imagine a block, actually you won't have to imagine, there will be pictures. <laughs> a block of ice and um, the lettering, the script, the story of the riparian zone is told through native seeds and um, whatever else might be unique to that zone. So I have pebbles in mine because I wanted to represent the natural filtration that exists in our great Miami valley buried aquifer um, and then I also have some nice orange leaves one because it's my favorite color and two it's my favorite um, metro park Huffman Dam right next to my house so that's my ice book the seeds are orange coneflower hairy wood mint and turtle head um, and then there are some other books as well So oh, that's just a small introduction to the beautiful partnership between renowned eco-artist Baja Ireland and the River Stewards here in Dayton. Um, I just want to emphasize how important her work is again. Um, she provides such a important awareness of the issues that rivers face. Um, she also provides a unique voice for the river. Um, we get to hear from the river in ways that we otherwise would not have. I encourage you to check out her National Geographic um, journals about uh, the different rivers that she has visited. She speaks from the river's perspective. It's really beautiful. Um, and I also appreciated the opportunity to connect what I'm learning about in my classes and in the River Steward program uh, with my love of art. Um, I love uh, watercolor and embroidery, but I've never tried ice sculpture before. Um, so that was a really unique experience, a little bit scary. Um, ice is a very difficult medium, but it was super fun. I'm glad to have done it and I'm sure the alumni are just as grateful. Um, so thank you for your time and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. My name is Ashley Cush and I'm currently doing an ETHO semester of service in South Carolina. One of the reasons I chose to do ethos was because I wanted the experience of applying my engineering abilities in a situation outside of your typical classroom or industry. Um, this situation so far has given me the opportunity to test my engineering abilities and critical thinking skills in so many new ways. Um, this experience has also given me the opportunity to meet new people and experience a new culture down here in South Carolina. In addition, I wanted to be able to use my knowledge to serve others and create a better world through engineering. This has been a challenging and equally rewarding experience so far, and I highly recommend every UD student get involved with Ethos.
The Baruch Marine Field Laboratory works to advance basic scientific research in marine and coastal sciences. The lab wants to provide educational opportunities through hands-on research. The Baruch Institute also has many different projects for students to work on to learn about the different estuary sciences. Most of these research projects require fresh seawater. So here is a system of seawater collection that leads all the way back to the wet lab for students to further do research. The seawater is then collected in a place called a wet lab. Here research involving spartina density, shrimp, oyster shells and more takes place. In addition to our ethos projects, we are helping some of the full-time staffs with their research to enhance our learning experience. Hi, my name is Ansi Johnson. I'm doing ethos this semester in Burwick Marine Lab, SC. I chose to do ethos because it is providing me with a lot of opportunities to extend my networking, providing me with good experience as an engineer. I'm so fascinated to meet new people and to learn new culture. Everyone has the fundamental right to fresh produce, but unfortunately, not everyone in the town of Georgetown has access to these resources. That's where our partner Zenobia and the Gullah Preservation Society of Georgetown come in. They've created a community garden filled with tons of produce, including collard greens, okra, onion, tomatoes, you name it. All the produce is free to anyone who just happens to stroll by. Another goal of the garden is to show just how easy it can be to start your own garden. Part of our project here at Ethos is to build raised garden beds so that we can grow fresh produce and we can show everyone how easy it is to use any of the resources you have lying around. We've used extra siding, scrap wood, and even tires. And it's quite rewarding to know that we are reusing these resources and showing people just how easy it can be to start your own garden. So I didn't see any questions. So with that, thank you for taking the time to listen to these amazing student perspectives. I hope you'll be inspired to further explore the work of Baja Erland or get your hands on Shannon's book. It's really great. Um, or tune into the Moral Courage Project podcast. I was involved in writing the second episode of that. So if you're interested, check that out. So enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Claire, and Leslie, and all, all the students. And uh, we're now delighted to have Matthew Curry speak. Matthew is the managing attorney at Advocates for Basic Legal Equality, known as ABLE in town. He also is an adjunct professor in UD's law school and has been on the ground working on environmental justice issues in our region for some time. So let us learn more about the Greater Dayton environmental justice issues and solutions we can all be part of. Great, thank you, Leanne, for um, inviting me, and thank you to the other uh, uh, people who put this great program together: um, Tony and Carlos and Shelley and Leslie. Um, it's been inspirational to hear everyone else speak, and I hope hope um, that I can add to that as well. Um, okay, I'm going to try to share here. Like Adrian, I <laughs> had it working earlier. Um, I did switch my computer, which maybe is impacting my ability to do it now. Um, I work for, um, I'll just start into it. I work for a nonprofit law firm called Advocates for Basic Legal Equality. And uh, we provide free uh, legal assistance to in civil matters to eligible individuals and to groups in Western Ohio. Um, we help them achieve self-reliance, equal justice and economic opportunity. Um, so maybe go down. Yeah, thank you. And then you can go down again, please. Um, this is our service area. So those of you who know Ohio, this is sort of the, um, 
the western and the northwestern part of Ohio. We're here in Dayton and the bottom left part of the map. And we go all the way up to Toledo. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. And this is how you can follow us on social media. So before starting, um, I wanted to uh, recognize it and acknowledge um, to maybe take 10 seconds. If you could just think about the original inhabitants of the land that you call home um, and you know, also the water resources in your watershed, um, which could be your community as well um, in recognition of World Water Day, which is um, on Monday. We'll just take maybe five or 10 seconds to recognize, acknowledge this. Okay, um, thank you. So we're talking about environmental justice and Adrian did an incredible job, I think, of laying this out. Um, people of color, indigenous people, low-income individuals are often at the front lines of environmental and climate crises, right? Um, whether it is uh, the Superfund site, which I'll talk a bit about, whether it is access to food, which I'll talk about, whether it is um, the climate uh, crisis that is facing us that Adrian talked about, or even other issues like COVID-19 um, as well. They're all impacting people of color, um, indigenous people, and low-income families um, at a disproportionate rate than, uh, than others. So um, Adrian also talked about um, the uh, 17 principles of environmental justice. Um, they were also, um, I believe, adapted um, at a second summit in Washington DC back in 2000. Um, there's a link where you can find them. Uh, maybe go to the next slide. I've got a, I put a couple of these up because I think it's important to frame the work that you do uh, to address environmental injustice. Um, so the, these principles of working together, right? And I just, I bolded some of the, the terms that I thought were um, relevant and impactful for me, right? So to eradicate environmental racism in our communities to make amends for past injustices, um, working from the ground up. You can go to the next slide, please. Right, recognizing traditional knowledge, um, understanding that we, we need each other and we're stronger together. And then allowing the, you know, the grassroots workers, the organizers, the impacted community to set their own priorities while recognizing that they have knowledge and expertise. Um, maybe the most important knowledge and expertise on these issues comes locally. So, yeah, you know, I, I believe that we're, we are, uh, have a short supply of serious political thinking around our planetary boundaries. This includes um, how do we address environmental injustice, work on these issues. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about um, some of the work we're doing here locally in Dayton at least I'm doing locally. Um, one of the uh, clients that I have is a neighborhood association um, spinoff that's working uh, to address a landfill uh, called the Valley Crest Landfill. Um, you can see from this snapshot of their website, this was um, put on the national parties list so by the EPA. So the EPA said this is a super fun site in 1994. Um, and today we are still, they are still working on getting this cleaned up. Um, so think about the time that it's taking, you know, this uh, community getting a hundred acre Superfund site landfill, uh, clean, not just cleaned up, but, you know, set up to uh, be uh, re reused in a way that the community would like it to see um, the reuse happen. So Adrian talked about uh, people and um, environmental justice is a people, is talking about people in society. Um, when we talk about political thinking uh, to around these issues of planetary boundaries, I tend to think about uh, social ecology and Murray Bookchin. Um, and he recognizes that nearly all of our present ecological problems originate in deep-seated social problems, right? So making the connection between ecological problems and social problems. Um, and specifically, it's the human over human domination that allows for this human over nature domination um, by domination of nature by humans, right? So when you look at it that way, you know, I think you have to think about addressing social issues and the hierarchical domination um, that cause those problems before we can address ecological issues. 
Um, and in my mind, this is what environmental justice, justice is all about. I also think that we can't, you know, we can't work within or rely on the existing model um, to create the change that we want to see. I think that we really need to um, uh, change the model, um, make it obsolete, and the existing model obsolete, and create a new model to work from. And I really like this quote from Buckminster Fuller. Um, it really, in my mind, highlights, um, you know, the need to find an, a new reality and stop fighting in this existing reality that. Where I come from, um, the work that I've been doing, you know, I see change around the edges, but really when you talk about these deep-seated social issues, um, very little change um, in that regard. So this is a framework that I try to use in my advocacy, um, understanding the history of your community, the current events of your community, what organizations are doing work, and then how you get engaged. So hopefully, um, I will be talking about each of these and you'll um, leave with some ideas on how to engage in your community around these issues. So I wanna talk about the work that Co-op Dayton is doing. Um, and in my mind, it's applying community learning, which is, you know, I'm a lawyer as Sister Leanne said, um, work at a law firm, um, but what is community learning and this new model um, of uh, development or responding to these social issues and I'm gonna go through two examples, talking about the Gem City Market, and then another uh, example, talking about unified power. So the concept of community lawyering is that social change, you know, it's really a social change theory, right? That you can't have social change unless it uh, comes when people without power organize around um, common grievances. But that more importantly, that it's only lasting when it's led by and directed by the people most impacted by, uh, by the issue. Um, Charles Elsesser is a, he's a lawyer in Florida. He writes a lot about community learning and social change. Um, so this is the kind of the lens that I come at the work that I've been trying to do over the past um, I don't know, six or seven years at, uh, with. Around the same time that I was thinking about, you know, how, do, how is a lawyer kind of be more, most impactful um, listening to the community? Um, working on issues the community says are important to them. Um, the city of Dayton, um, public health, Montgomery County, um, put out what are called opportunity maps for the city of Dayton. And what an opportunity map is, it is a, um, essentially it's a tool that can be used by the community to understand um, what kind of issues they could face, they are facing. Um, and it also is a tool to help uh, prioritize issues, right? So opportunity, these maps were uh, created by the Curran Institute at the Ohio State University. Um, they they uh, define opportunity essentially as a set of exter external conditions that support individuals and communities to be more likely to succeed um, and, or excel. And it's based on um, historical policy, contemporary policies, right? That's what is deciding what, what communities have opportunity, which communities don't have opportunity. Um, it could be intentional or unintentional policies. Um, and, you know, this leads to benefits for certain groups um, while disadvantages for other groups of people. So the city of Dayton, Montgomery County Public Health put out these maps in about, I think it was 2015 for the city of Dayton. And one thing that stuck out to the community, um, especially in West and Northwest Dayton, is that the city of Dayton um, has more than half of the food deserts in in um, the city are in low and very low opportunity communities. Um, well, 23, 20, 32% are in moderate opportunity uh, communities. Um, so again, looking at why is this, how is this, you know, this data historically uh, relevant, but also using it as a tool to address um, these inequalities. And I think that's the important piece here. So this is the city of Dayton, um, and these are, this is what is the opportunity map that public health put out uh, about six or seven years ago. Um, you'll see the white areas are the very low opportunity areas, the darker the blue, the darkest blue is the very high opportunity area. And you also see um, this tracking of a yellow line um, around some of these uh, neighborhoods, and that is um, identified as a food desert. Um, I, I will just note that some food, um, 
uh, activists use the term food, food apartheid to uh, show that, to recognize that, um, that, you know, the creation of a food desert is not natural, right? You think of a desert as being a natural phenomenon, right? But um, these are the result of historical policies that um, Adrian talked about. And I think the next slide may highlight this as well. Right, so here is, Adrian talked about these uh, redlining um, and redlining maps, right? So redlining, as we heard, is, was a official uh, federal policy of the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, to create um, residential um, security maps, right? So where can the federal government insure a mortgage? Um, the green areas are where there's, they will insure mortgage. This is based, um, came out of the 1930s where they would insure mortgage. Red areas was where it was essentially hazardous. They would not insure mortgages in the, in the red areas. And I don't have it up here now um, or my slide, but when you look at these maps, essentially, and you look at the, uh, the, white, um, the white areas, essentially what you have is the same areas that have been redlined from the 30s that are low opportunity today are also where the majority of the minority population lives. So a highly segregated uh, community um, that I think draws back from these maps in the 30s and even earlier when you look at issues like restrictive covenants or put on properties and where people could and couldn't buy land or homes. So out of this um, work, these maps came a community conversation that was convened by the Miami Valley Organizing Collaborative. Um, and they identified this issue of food access as um, something they wanted to address. Um, Co-op Dayton was incorporated in 2016, essentially to incubate a grocery store. Um, it was put together, these conversations were advocates, activists, academics, people from government and neighborhood leaders coming together to have these conversations. Um, you know, so in order, they, they identified food access as the issue they wanted to address. And they said, we want to open up our own grocery store. Um, best practices were studied and this concept of a cooperative um, model was, um, was identified as the model to use. But I think importantly, Co-op Dayton sees itself not as, you know, there to open up a grocery store, but also maybe more importantly to create a movement. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we uh, get into this. So the Jim C. Mark is what came out of these conversations. Um, it is a worker-owned and community-owned grocery store, right? So you can become a member, um, and it's going to be opening in, um, in um, I don't know, later this month or early next month, I think. But it's on Lower Salem Avenue. If you're in the area, I, you know, you probably know about it. So it's based on these concepts from uh, Spain, the Mondragon principles. Um, I'm not going to talk about all these, but essentially they're based on the Mondragon is a corporation in Spain that came out, it came uh, to existence after, um, after the uh, Spanish Civil War. And uh, the, you know, the anti-fascists who lost the war in the Basque region were sort of left to fend for themselves. Adrian talked a little bit about how communities feel like they've got to fend for themselves today. Um, I think you know, when, you're, when you lose a war, the Civil War, um, the government was not there to help you. So what the community did instead was they came together and started these ideas of cooperation. And these are principles that are based on just general cooperative principles. And I think I've got a couple on the next slide, a couple examples of how these go into more depth. Um, right, so democratic governance, um, you know, ideas of uh, basic equality, um, social transformation, um, you know, ideas that, you know, these cooperatives are moving towards um, more caring and just economy, economic structure. Um, the idea that, you know, capital is subordinate um, to labor. Um, you know, we talked about the wordle um, that Tony put up earlier. I think, um, you know, one of the words I wrote down was, I think I wrote down capitalism and profit as two words that stuck out to me. Um, universality, education are some of the words, some of the principles from Mondragon. And if you go to the next slide, sort of the, the other thing that I think co is doing is moving towards this concept of a solidarity economy, um, and it, which is part of a global movement. Um, they, there are six principles in here, um, solidarity, participa participatory democracy, equality, sustainability, and pl pluralism. 
And it's sort of trying to, it's trying to create a framework for what, what is considered to be a post capital system um, for the world. And we're really spearheading this locally. And what's really exciting is that I think we're starting to see this come to fruition. So if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about what's called unified power. Unified power is a, a community a land trust that um, was just incorporated um, last fall, came out of work that was happening around co uh, the Gem City market with Co-op Dayton. And why it's important is because the community said to themselves, look, you know, we're building a grocery store. What's going to happen is gentrification. So how can we stop that, right? And this is a concept that the community identified as a way that they want to see the gentrification stopped. And it, this is direct, directly out of their corporate documents, this, this, uh, this language, um, which I think is really powerful, right? So, you know, they're explicitly Black and allied communities working cooperatively. They want to take uh, properties off the speculative market to create community controlled assets. Um, they talk about a just transition from extractive capitalist system into one where communities are ecologically, emotionally, spiritually, culturally, and economically restorative and regenerative. And this is part of what you see, um, I think, the, you know, these impacted communities, environmental justice communities wanting to do and wanting to see um, uh, happen with, uh, with in, their, in their neighborhoods. So if you go to the, the, maybe the next page, this is more about who they are, sort of their, how they promote their vision and mission, about acquiring land, holding land. Um, I'm probably at time, so I'll stop there. Um, you can go maybe to the last slide. So if you're interested in knowing, learn, hearing more about this work, um, this is an article I wrote last year um, where we, and where you can get it. So with that, I guess I'll leave it to Leanne to see if there's questions and then to the breakout. Thank you so much, Matt. If people could uh, put any of their questions or comments they have in the breakout, uh, in the chat box, that would be really great. Some people I know may need to leave, but we just did want to remind you of the events coming up. So next week, excuse me, in two weeks on April 7th, starting at 3.30, we'll be looking at a movement takes flight and looking at the Landmark Environmental Summit in Washington, DC, where new principles were introduced uh, regarding the inequities of environmental protection. And this panel is gonna feature members who are part of that historic milestone and real trailblazers from that summit. So it'll be an important one to, to be sure to register for. Each of these weeks are important to register for individually. So please do go to the human rights website um, the info's on the program to be able to do that. We did have uh, we did have a moment for a quick um, reflection. I know a number of people do have to go, and we are so grateful for all the presenters that did come today. We we do want to uh, do a, a very quick wrap up. Uh, so if people want to stay and do the brief mentee, we can do that. And then we will have the opportunity to really have some dialogue. Tony, take it away. Hi, all. It's the same uh, mentee from before. Um, just a different slide. So I've shared screens and I'll put the link again in the uh, in the box. Oops, excuse me. So the link is in the chat and, uh, or you can use the QR code or go to minty.com and use that code.
just a few more seconds. All right. Well, folks, it's there's not many coming in. So uh, if you can go ahead. Oh, there we go. As soon as I said that, I knew something would happen. So all of these wonderful presentations and that we've heard today and thinking about these terrible uh, injustices, as well as the hope. Uh, that has been sprinkled throughout. What do we need to achieve environmental justice? I like activism, anti-racism, the new economy, uh, advocating and advocacy, humanity, relationships, equity, empathy and love and a sense of justice right in the middle of it. Um, in a lot of ways, the opposite of uh, what we started out with, when, what we saw as barriers I think um, there's, there's a real lesson there. We can easily identify the barriers and we know what we need to change to uh, move towards a more just uh, and inclusive, uh, sustainable society and world. Thank you. So thank you all uh, so much. And we do invite you all now to unmute yourselves and go ahead, show your video. And it looks like we have some people for uh, some good dialogue. So I guess the, the first question we could just ask maybe is there, Anybody that has some general questions or comments you'd like to make to one another as this large group, and then we could think about, you know, maybe going into a smaller group. So was there anything burning that you know, we were sensitive to the time as it was un unfolding today, but something that you did want to ask? We have Adrian with us and Matt. Leslie, Vince had to go. Okay then. So how are our breakout rooms going? Well, uh, Sister Leanne, I think Matt Fisher had a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, yeah, I thought I'd jump in. I guess um, I was curious, so the pandemic came up a couple times and I was curious about what our speakers may think about, you know, what lessons can we take from the pandemic that we can then apply to uh, environmental justice issues going forward? I could take a stab at that. Um, I think from, from my perspective, it just shows that, you know, the existing structures that we have in place aren't working, um, that the vulnerable populations are going to remain vulnerable, um, whether it's to climate change or pandemics or to whatever um, natural disaster or other event is going to um, challenge their resiliency. And that, you know, I think that Despite, you know, look, like in Montgomery County, you know, there's been efforts by public health to get out into um, the neighborhoods where people aren't, typically don't have access, right? And I still think that the statistics I see, you know, show disparities in who's getting, who's impacted by the pandemic, right? Um, but then also who has access to like uh, the vaccine, for example. And so in my mind, it just shows that the need to think about the systems that we have in place differently and probably that um, you know, the existing structures we have in place that we have set up are, you know, probably aren't set up to create true equity. I, my comment would be that seems to be quite an understatement, Matt. You, you think the existing systems probably aren't set up to create true equity? Um, I, I think I would go as far to say that they're set up to do exactly the opposite. 
and to accumulate wealth into a, a, a small, the hands of a small elite. And I wonder how we who have some power, because we're all sitting here right now, uh, so we obviously are more powerful than many people on the planet, what we do uh, to, to try to change that and to shake up the system. Javier, you're on mute. Well, I would like to add to, to what uh, Matt said. Uh, I am very sad uh, about what is going on in the Amazon. In Brazil, there is a record number of people uh, deceased in the Amazon region in Brazil. And whole civilizations are disappearing. And with that, their, their particular cultures and languages. So this is a, a disaster also from the cultural point of view. Now, uh, the problem is, is uh, about equity. Um, many of them probably rely on their traditional medicine and probably they mistrust on the Western medicine, like the vaccines. And so uh, we want to save their lives, but, but they probably they mistrust even more than, than we do on the medicine. And so the pandemic uh, and the economic crisis uh, and the health crisis uh, also has cultural dimensions that we need to be very aware of. Uh, so for example, here in the United States, African-Americans mistrust the vaccine way more than, than the, the white people or the uh, indigenous American people. Can you imagine what would be the difference between the, I mean, I mean what would be the level of mistrust of the, the tribes in the Amazon with respect to the Western medicine? You know, there are so many questions that need to be answered. I have something else, but I don't want to keep talking if other folks want to talk. I, I was just thinking of parallels potentially to the AIDS crisis and HIV um, in, in the global South. And there should be lessons learned in how some of that reluctance to, to engage with Western medicine was overcome, at least in certain areas that could help maybe, but I, I don't know, those barriers seem very insurmountable. Is the question is a difference? Right. Or were you making a point or were you asking a question as to why there's a difference? I was making a point, but I'd like to oh, hear what you. the difference <laughs> was. Yeah, I was good. Just speaking before you. <laughs> uh, it, it, well, I don't, know, I don't know who was speaking, but. Uh, I think it was Matt, Matt Fisher and Javier, yeah. Well, Adrian, you put a, a, a link into the chat box. Would you like to share a little bit? Yes, this is a blog I wrote. Yeah, this is, this is the blog I wrote about why Black Americans distrust researchers and why they were hesitant to, take the, to get the vaccine. Of course, right now, that is not the primary reason Black people are not vaccinated. Once again, racism is the reason because we don't have access to the vaccine. Here in PG County, which had the highest rate of um, COVID-19 in the state, very few people were vaccinated. And actually Maryland is at the bottom of the list in the country for the number of people vaccinated, black people vaccinated. So this, there is a historical support for this um, distrust. And I think that people are reaching out a, a variety of different methodologies to address that. But I do think that it's it's rightful. I have had my vaccine, or at least my second one is next week. But you know, I, I don't judge people for being mistrustful. I just hope that they get over that um, and get their vaccine. So and, and I, I'm surprised that people elsewhere aren't um, 
mistrustful thinking about the comment that was made when the when COVID first, um, I guess, became um, was recognized as a big issue, which it always was a big issue. That these French um, researchers said, "Do we? Why shouldn't? Um, why aren't we just going to Africa? They don't have any medications or access to healthcare. We should test for a vaccine over there." So and and so I think that that there is a validity behind that mistrust, you know. There's also though data that indicates that there are significant populations within the US, not people of color who for political and other reasons are, are not willing to take the, the vaccine. Um, so it is, there are barriers for specific communities, but there are also ideologies and other um, politicized dimensions to this conversation uh, that should not be overlooked. Um, the reality is there has not been a national cohesive effort in the United States to support science and support good science and vaccination and clear messaging around the pandemic and that's manifesting uh, itself differently for different communities, but it is a, a failure of governance, um, not of individual communities. So I agree with you in part, but I disagree with you, and it's okay to disagree about something else. I think having the, having the ability to decide whether or not you're gonna take the vaccine is different than never even, even being given that choice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what I'm referring to when I talk about Black communities and other communities of color. I think that to consciously decide not to get the vaccine is something that we see in, uh, you know, not just in, in um, white communities. We do see some communities of color where people make that decision, but they, for the most part, don't even have the capability of deciding because the, the issue is, because I, I say that because I live it and my friends have, have lived it. We've only recently been able to, some of us to get the vaccine, even if we have pre-existing conditions. So, you know, I think that's a bit different. I think are important, you know, but one is based on a personal decision where one is based on lack of power. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, I definitely agree that it's, uh, everybody needs to have the empowerment and the access to be able to make the decision for themselves. But I think structurally and governance wise, the, the country overall has not been led in a direction of valuing, understanding, trusting science and being ha have healthcare and the opportunity and accessibility for everyone um, to make those decisions in an informed and empowered manner. Um, and the issue has been negatively politicized in a way that is um, a concern from from my side. Um, and I think the uh, international um, dynamics are even worse. Um, Tony was talking about lessons learned from the AIDS crisis. The reality is that still on many different issues, um, take malaria, for example, which continues to be a very uh, significant killer in the global south and can be um, very easily addressed, continues to kill many people because of the structural barriers to ensuring um, people have access to, to what is needed. I don't think there's been a tremendous amount of lesson learned around epidemics and illness that has resulted in, in equities um, globally as well. So I don't think the lessons are, the coronavirus shows that the lessons from the AIDS epidemic and other um, um, epidemics and uh, global health issues have certainly not been learned or dealt with structurally. And, and Shelly, I totally agree with you this time because um, you know with Hurricane Katrina and everything like that, we were, we, the lesson was to protect our most vulnerable and we did not do that. So, you know, we didn't learn the lessons and we didn't put the infrastructure in place 
to address that. And I'll be putting in another blog in just a moment that talked about that, <laughs> where I interviewed um, a professor um, who works on these issues. And you know that was his main premise was that we didn't learn. You know, we've had so many times, I mean, so many lessons and how many does it take before we get the message and engage in some important action? And it's interesting, right? The impact of population, when you look at the CDC's social vulnerability index, right? It, at least in the date, it aligns really closely with the opportunity maps. So the high, most vulnerable population communities are also the lower opportunity communities, which are also the red line communities which is also where people are being evicted. So the other work I do is eviction work, right? So by far, the, the, what we see in eviction court, as far as who's being evicted, it's African-American women, single moms usually. And, you know, I think it, there are these systems in place that, you know, aren't, you, I don't know how you change them without changing the system. I guess what I'm trying to say here. Um, because in my mind, it's, you know, the, the eviction process, you know, can be seen as having these racist undertones. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a racist system or not, but I think, you know, it's, you can make arguments that, you know, the system that evicts people from their homes is racist. Um, you know, so I, I guess I'm just saying that because all these issues can be intertwined, um, you know, and it's just, um, you know, thinking holistically or, you know, systemically about them is the other part of what I try to get across when I was talking. Bring up the privilege a bit more just because, um, you know, getting back to climate and environmental justice, um, you know, I think I feel like there's a lot of privilege in my life that has allowed me to examine environment, being an environmentalist. Um, and I just wonder how you create the right spaces so that we're not, I mean, people a lot of times the people that are experiencing the most injustices don't have the time to maybe focus on them if their immediate needs are not being met to live, right? Or to educate their children, right? We all know this, right? So I'm, I'm just being really honest, like how do you continue to break out down that barrier? How do we continue to make the environment at the core, you know, our water at the core of everything, right? So that, um, so that we all have time for it. So it doesn't come from a space of privilege. Um, so we're in a space where it's being led by the people who are most disenfranchised. Um, I'm just asking that question, honestly, because Adrian, you said you've experienced it on the front lines, right? And then now you're involved and our voice for others as well. So I just, um, I really am challenging myself on how to try to, try to think about that. I think um, I'm Jackie Housel. I'm a geographer and I am on the faculty at Sinclair. Um, and I think that uh, Matt Curry has a great example and that is that Gem City Market. So at Sinclair, uh, people will say we do social justice every day because we serve the community in a different way than perhaps other universities do. Um, and you will see the faculty there. I have my PhD. I don't, um, but I have chosen to work at a space that um, where, where we can truly make a difference and try to break down structures or at least try to open things up a little bit. And I do think that that Gem City Market is such a good example of the community coming up. Now, there are other examples in Dayton as well. I have worked a bit on the Welcome Dayton when it init was initiated. I don't work too much on it anymore. Same thing. That was a groundswell of the community. And those are that is what sticks, right? Change is local and it's small and it's hard to um, go in there as if you are you know, I'll be there for six months. No, that's not good enough. You have to be in the community forever. Um, and and so I, I see that that, I don't know. So I appreciate that example, Matt Curie. Um, Amaha is one of my, um, he's in my department um, and he's one of the co-directors. But you can see that movement so well 
in that particular um, initiative. And it's clear that there's going to be other initiatives that follow. So um, I, I'm really excited to see these kind of really local initiatives. And I'm appreciative, Matt, of the work that you do on eviction. I think it is so important. I also, of course, I'm a geographer. Geography plays a big role in this. And I think that mapping helps us not only solve problems, it helps us identify problems, right? So we become problem finders. Um, and it's really important to think about the ways that um, these disciplines can work together. As you are doing, you know, with the river project, I mean, all those things are really good. We get some of your students to come back to work with us when they go and they're working in the city. <laughs> so um, we have enjoyed those relationships as well. So anyhow, so thank you, Matt. I really appreciate what you're, you are doing every day and saying. Oh, thank you for that. Jacqueline, I really appreciate your comments and hope to get to know you better. The, uh, I think the thing about the Gem City market that really struck me is time. They took a deliberate, slow approach to really build all the relationships, get the buy and ensure the local community. Um, Oh, Leanne, and I thought it moved quickly. I can't believe <laughs> <laughs> what they've done. It's been five years. It's incredible. Right. Um, and certainly if anybody wants to get a tour, um, we're doing, um, not me, but uh, I know that they are doing tours right now. So if you contact me, I can link you up to, to get a tour of the market. It's incredible. You know, I think what's more incredible is that they're already realizing the unintended consequences of their work. They're realizing that gentrification that's happening around the market, that they might be pricing out the actual community members who started the market, and that they've created unified power to already kind of combat that, which was once again the community's idea, right? So, I mean, I think that's the lesson learned, that those of us, including those community members who were most well-intentioned, we were still coming across what was going to be an unintended consequence of our actions to solve a problem in the best hearted way. Um, and so it's, it's, it's continuous, right? It's reflective. Um, you know, I, I find that to be really fascinating that they're already identifying that before it's happened quite yet, right? Before the market even opened, because it, it would happen and it will maybe, but um, anyway, that's what's impressive. It's a great conversation. I need to leave, unfortunately, but I put my email if anyone wants to contact me um, later. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Um, yes, I think what I was meaning by pace is knowing that a big box store can destroy a wetland in six months. <laughs> it was just this gradual kind of pace that's so thoughtful and in including all of the stakeholders and impacts, which I appreciate that model as a reminder. I'm wondering, um, I know people need to go. Is anybody else we haven't heard from want to say something? Paul, how are you doing? Or I'm just interested in some of your perspectives from where you are right now. Yeah, I'm doing really well. I know folks have to jump off for other events. Um, I was, one of the questions that occurred to me, we had a lot of discussion of the sort of social movements theory and doing the work that Uniform Power was talking about of a just transition. I was wondering if there are, relevant sort of scientific questions about environmental justice and what that looks like, the equal sharing of burdens and benefits that are separate from some of these social scientific questions or whether in fact, there's no sort of scientific question that isn't also in some ways a social scientific question in this space. Um, that's a very philosophical question, but I plead my sort of disciplinary. So are, you, are you separating the natural physical sciences from the social sciences right now? That's what I'm trying to do, and maybe someone will tell me that that's you can't do that. But um, well, yeah. I just want to be clear. Adrian, you want to take a stab at that one? No, <laughs> I think <laughs> I mean certainly speaking as an ecologist, where the challenge is is moving into what would be less traditional ecology work is 
is sometimes risky and not always rewarded within the academy. And I think this is where we're trying to get people really looking at what are the ways we need to partner, um, do community-based research where you're really listening to the questions of the community and trying to provide accompaniment. But I think there's these there's transformation of the field going on right now. And I know that there are certainly AAAS is also working with many in the physical sciences of looking at human rights issues um, and all too to try to get at this. But trying to identify questions where we can provide data, I think is a really important work that the natural scientists, that physical, chemical, life sciences um, really are doing. And certainly the medical field that's been happening in the public health world and all. But Leanne, I think if I can just follow up and I'd love Adrian's thoughts on this, you know, in a different event that we had, we had a um, OBGYN talk about using race as a factor in, a, you know, medical sort of um, uh, condition checks and that the results are that ultimately um, that factor coming in, which statistically uh, would is perceived to be relevant, um, is really a reflection of actually racism in the system rather than some biologically determinative aspect of race. But the systems uh, as of yet and science as of yet, as far as I understand it, and I'm not trying to get at the scientific method and I'm, I am not a natural scientist, but um, and even medical and healthcare have not yet figured out how to measure the racism that exists as opposed to it manifesting itself in uh, um, uh, using race as, it, as some kind of determinative and that reinforces and makes more systemic the racism that exists. Um, so that's what I was, think Paul was trying to get at and I don't know if, uh, neither Paul nor I are scientists, so <laughs> we don't know maybe how to speak the language in the right way, but um, for the, you know, how does the scientific systems change and scientists change in a way that takes into account uh, social issues in a more meaningful way, way rather than reflecting them ultimately in statistics and data and science in a way that has a perverse impact. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I, I know that, you know, there are, uh, you know, there's um, unconscious bias, of course, and, and conscious bias. And we know that um, the medical profession, for the most part, has, has admitted that they treat people differently based on race. And I think that's different than, um, you know, that's, a, predis that's um, a predetermined way of treating people based on their race or a predetermined way of interacting with people. Uh, based on their race, as opposed to utilizing the precautionary principle, which is what people should be utilizing when it comes to, for example, COVID-19. One of the things we kept saying here in Maryland, in PG County, was that you need to collect data by race. And the reason was because everybody could see across the country that people were dying at higher rates. Um, you know, people of color were dying. And so if you, according to the precautionary principle, if you see an issue and you think there might be a, an issue, then you have the responsibility to, at that point, do something, right? So the, the point was gather that data. Yeah, and it's gather that racial and ethnic data because we need that when we determine the plan for rolling out the vaccine, And it's, for example. And instead we have this ridiculous mess where they rolled it out based on age. Well, the literature shows us once again, racially, that black people and people of color don't live as long as their white counterparts for a number of reasons, and a lot of them based on health. So, you know, that may not have been the best way to roll out the vaccine. So I think that two people need to, not us people, but the medical profession needs to think differently. First, they've got to change the way they interact and the assumptions that they have based on race, right? You know, people aren't going to pay. They don't have insurance. They're going to be. They're not going to follow directions and all of those things. And then, secondly, when you see an issue and you see it reoccurring based on race, you need to do something. So, I, for me, it's two different things. I don't know, but I could. Be I, yeah, I would say. Um, I would say one thing to follow up, Shelley, on your point is um, we are looking at 
multi-generational poverty. Okay, so there's a lot of work being done on multi-generational poverty. Okay, and the effects of that. And so that's one way to look at like compounded effects, right, of a certain neighborhood that might be in poverty. And then what race is that? What environmental factors are in that and, and, all, and all of that. But back on Paul's question too, um, you know, I'm going to do my little spiel again on like, I think if you look at the, if you look at, if you look at how we all live in watersheds, then you're truly understanding the convergence of the ecological, natural science and the social science together. Because you're basically saying we all live on a land mass, a geological bioregional boundary that's dictated by the social, economic, political systems, land use, right? That happen within it. Okay, and that is gonna determine what your A, water quality is to the least, right? But to the most, way more than that, it'll determine all of your ecological scientific factors, right? Because you're realizing that I am going to measure this area, this, this watershed based on um, those boundaries, right? Those are ecological bioregional boundaries. And so then you can measure those on top of the social, ecological, economic and political systems that are happening within it. That's my best bet to kind of giving you a solid answer to a very philosophical question, but it's the work I do. Um, I work on watershed, um, I work on a watershed lens. That's what I teach. And um, that's the science I do. Um, and the social science I do. So I, I think it's the most brilliant answer. Um, and if, you know, John Wesley Powell had it his way, our states would have been divided up into watersheds before they were states, right? And rivers would have been the center of every single community and not the border. So I, I think I think that's the best example you can get to, to comparing it. Leanne, as an ecologist, I feel like you want to chime in. So I'm going to stop. But I think I think it's the solution in um, a lot of these areas when you're looking at the interconnectedness. I do know we as natural scientists have said we really need the social scientists. We need to partner, you know, where we can really listen to communities and then um, and the and the methods and best way to work with communities, and then see where can our ability to gather data to get it where can that be of assistance to the questions of the community and the needs of the community. Where the shift is, is uh, the scientists who in the past might have gone in and say, I have my research hypothesis in question. Can I put this on this community and use this community to test it? Oh, and then I go three years later when my grant runs out. We can't be behaving like that anymore. We really have to say we're in partnership together in a longer time period because we all care about it together and then see how can we each share for our gifts and um, and let the people take the data. To, you know, this. Uh, Citizen science is now shifting in term to community science because of the potential negative connotation of are you a citizen or not for many people, but that sense of community-based science where the community is engaged gathering their own data and testing, which I think was part of what the Moral Courage uh, Project is talking about. The people in Flint, Michigan started doing their own testing and seeing what was going on, you know, and then, and then to, be, to make those changes. So, but how do we, you know, give those skills or give the equipment the money that those things cost and do it. One one of our ESA colleagues starting back, you know, he had a government job and and back when he was first doing this kind of data, he was working with a Latinx community and all the information they were publishing and the education was all in English. And he said, this has to stop. So he just, just started making like comic books, like simple educational materials in Spanish and comic books and things so that people could get the message and understand why they shouldn't eat those fish that they were just getting themselves and fishing regularly that had high toxic doses for them and were poisoning them. So those kinds of examples of it's some of it's just common sense, but sadly we we don't always implement it. But if we listen to two people um, and work with and partner and build community together, we will we'll have more of a chance of getting there. 
uh, we have, well, the Marianists had a, a very, very uh, good work with the farmers in Peru. Uh, the, the thing is, the uh, brother Felipe Melcher, who unfortunately passed away some years ago, started a, a, a project of teaching the, the local community how to assess the water quality of the rivers near, nearby and, um, and mining zone. And so they, what they did, did is to assess the quality of water based of the micro, no, the organism, the algae. And so uh, if the algae uh, in, one, in one section of the river disappear in, in a, in, in, from one, one time, one point in time to the other, that means uh, that the water is more acidic. And therefore that means that probably the companies or, or the, the mining, uh, uh, the miners were uh, dumping uh, a, a, a water with chemical products. And so by doing so, the farmers become, became more aware of the quality of the water quality without having to study how to use very ex expensive scientific apparatuses. And so that was a, a very cool project. And I think, uh, Leanne, one of, one of the, the sisters went there, I think, for what I remember. Kathleen? Yeah. Uh, Kathleen. Caitlin, who was a UD grad, then went yeah. and, and did yeah, so part she, of that project for a year yeah, after so, graduating. Yeah. yeah, she had a one year experience, I think. Unfortunately, this, this program is, is dying because of the lack of support. But uh, we, we can learn from these uh, local experiences, how with very little, you can empower the community and, and, and get a, you know, a, mo a, a movement that eventually may uh, make the, the big companies to reassess their, uh, their activities. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I think the the movements in the community work is really important, but I, I also think we um, we do need to get at the governance structures and the governance systems that we we have more intentionally. Um, and I I know that time is really of the essence in terms of the fight for environmental sustainability and climate change. Um, and so community-based work is really very important, but um, we need, you know, we need some level of, of changes in top-down structural, systemic and governance um, dimensions before, you know, as you were saying, we have communities who are gonna cease to exist and environmental ecosystems that are going to cease to exist. and. I, I think the urgency really demands um, yeah. major action at every level. But I don't, I, I don't know that, you know, I, I think there's a tension there. And so I think communities need to be massively involved in, in that governance change. It's not to say that communities shouldn't be involved in it. It shouldn't be top down in that sense, um, but, yeah, Carlton's got some good information in the chat. Yeah, it's a both and, and certainly natural scientists have been working, you know, to get the training, the trust to do that kind of public policy, the advocacy and speak to elected officials from, from that as well. So I, I, I think it's a both and. Sort of on that topic though, what really struck me today was um, it's sort of this happy coincidence that the work of doing justice at the local level is also this work of building resilience, right? Because individually, all these people are not very powerful, but when you bring them together and organize them, they can do things like build capital and run a supermarket and things like that, right? And that act of building a community is gonna add that resilience when we do see climate effects, whether we you know, solve these problems or whether we have bigger problems, you know? these communities will be better situated to make it through because of that. So I think that's a nice, nice synergy, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to uh, make things more complicated. 
what if local communities are against this? And I, uh, I'm going to explain myself. What happens is that uh, the drug cartels have moved uh, from, central, from Mexico to, to Central America and, and to South America and became more powerful. And so they hire local communities to, to do illegal activities, like, like mining, for example. And so, uh, because now with the pandemic, they don't have any uh, you know, means of, of, uh, of living, they are going, they, I mean, uh, uh, they are looking for, for this drug uh, or these illegal uh, uh, lords for job. And so these people are distributing help to them to, to uh, construct a base of power, pretty much like the Godfather. And so now, if you want to, to do social work, environmental work, you will have to fight against a, 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 an even more organized uh, social-based organization with locals and local communities. You know, this is, this is going to be very complicated, but this is the problem that we are going to face uh, after this, after when the pandemic is, is over. the challenges are only going to increase. <laughs> well, we've been uh, at it since 3.30. And um, there's no caterer to kick us out from this uh, virtual social to say that, you know. <laughs> As they normally do is I feel like we could take a good glass of Dayton water, certainly. and. Uh, as we continue to share, but I just want, if anybody hasn't had a chance to speak yet uh, or added some closing remarks, we can do that and then wrap this up. 